the Southwest Black Chamber of Commerce fifth annual expand men's conference. Again, I'll be your host and MC. My name is Marvin Jackson. I'm Archer Western Contractors based out of Irving, Texas. We have a good event for you this evening. Right now, get ready to come on. Uh, we'll bring the Dallas County representative uh, to carry the program forward. Okay, very good. So, 
I'll get ready to introduce one of our speakers. I'm going to read this at the spread. Uh, Kenneth Walker, practice in the area of business transactions, business law, business formation, and dissolution. Cor uh, uh, cor corporations, partnerships, contracts, real estate, estate planning, a lot of common letters here. Uh, will and trust, computer and tax. Uh, Mr. Walker's home is Memphis, Tennessee. He received his JD from Harvard Law, Harvard Law School, and a BA in Economics and Afro African American Studies from Harvard College. Right now, please welcome Mr. Kenneth Walker. possibility of licensing your business. You, one pathway to growth 
He's adding new business partners, either passive investors or active partners. All of these pathways to growth, they have their fundamental business side, but they also are fraught with legal risk. And so you need to know before embarking on any of these pathways, in addition to the legal objectives, the legal goals, I'm sorry, the business objectives, the business goals, the business plans, what are the legal obstacles that I may encounter along those pathways? In terms of those obstacles, let's talk about some generally. You may encounter contract disputes. And so the best defense against a contract dispute is a good contract, okay? It's fundamental. After you have signed a bad contract, you still have some legal rights, you still have some legal options, but you have given away your major advantage. So it is fundamental to business success. Any contract that you sign, make sure it's a good contract. It's amazing to me how often business people come into my office and I, I, I will not get into, obviously, names, I, I protect client confidences, but I, I've got a situation now where the clients came in um, and I looked at the contract and I just told them straight, you signed a bad contract. I cannot take, I, this is not a situation where you can take lemons and turn it into lemonade, okay? There are certain things you can't turn into lemonade. And so when you sign a bad contract, to a certain extent, you may be stuck. I'm not saying it's hopeless. I'm not saying you don't have rights. I'm not saying you don't have options. But the best defense to a contract dif uh, dispute is a good contract to begin with. And you need to understand what that looks like legally. You may understand from a business perspective what it looks like. But if it does not translate into the correct legal language, then what you thought was a very good contract may turn out to be a disaster. Other disputes, customer disputes. Customers are your best friends and your worst enemy at the same time because they are essential to your business. But if they're dissatisfied in some way, then they can be a threat to your business. Real estate disputes. Um, it's amazing to me how many business people <laughs> are not real estate experts, but they assume because they have signed an apartment lease many times in their life, they have bought homes many times in their life, that they understand how to negotiate a commercial lease, how to buy commercial property. If you're not an expert in this area, you do not, because there are all types of legal traps for the unwary when it comes to real estate transactions. Debt and credit issues, these, you, you, you've got to collect your money, you're borrowing money, legal relationships. All money is not good money, so sometimes it's very tempting to grab that loan that's in front of you, but you need to understand what are the consequences to me if I'm late? What are the consequences to me if I default, if things go badly? What are the consequences to me of taking this money? Am I, by taking this money today, jeopardizing potentially my business and is there a way for me to protect myself? Intellectual property, uh, we just take for granted that what comes out of our heads is, is not important, but it is very important, it's very valuable, and it has to be protected. Otherwise, you may have given up one of your most valuable assets. We spoke of buying a business as a pathway to growth, but buying a business could be buying a lawsuit. If you do not do your due diligence, if you don't understand the legal side of buying a business, you may have bought a lawsuit. 
One of my favorite topics is business divorces. Business, business relationships are very much like marriages. It's easy. Calvin and I can shake hands right now and enter into a partnership. No formalities under Texas law required. We're in business together. Easy to get in, hard to get out of. We just shook hands, right? And now we fall out. We've got to get a business divorce. And it's just as bad and just as treacherous as getting a divorce from a marital relationship. And unfortunately, the emotional dynamics are just as bad. That's the hardest part of my job when it comes to unwinding business relationships in terms of business partnerships. The legal and the business side may be quite straightforward, but by the time people get to that stage, if they have not already had a prenup, a business prenup, then they're so emotionally charged, they will um, um, make the situation much more difficult uh, than it has to be. Taxes and government regulators. You know, death and taxes, yeah, that's real. Government regulators are real. And if you're not cognizant of your obligations in, the, in this regard, especially payroll taxes, okay, and we'll talk about that a little more when we get to employees. If you're not cognizant of that, then you may be only building up a business to turn it over to the tax man. Now let's talk about employment disputes. Um, two perspectives, the employer perspective, the employee perspective. And that there's a natural tension. The employee's goal is to maximize profit. The employer, I'm sorry, the employer's goal is to maximize profit. The employee's goal is to max, maximize compensation and optimize working conditions. And so there's a natural t tension, all right? You gotta try to balance the two from both perspectives. From the employer perspective, here's my bottom line legal advice. It comes from a quote from President Barack Obama don't do stupid stuff. He used a different word. Okay? And there are two corollaries to that that I should have put in the paper. Not only don't you do stupid stuff, don't hire people who do stupid stuff. And by no means put people who do stupid stuff in charge of other people. Bad things will always happen when stupid stuff is done, okay? And unfortunately, a lot of stupid stuff is illegal. And so, you know, employers, you know, have this concept, and it's great. I own this, okay? I own my house, but I cannot set off an explosive device and blow up my house without my neighbors and the police, and a whole bunch of other people having some say in that affair, okay? You cannot do just anything. You're not a dictator in your business. You have power, but you have to operate within the limits, okay? From an employee's perspective, don't make the job you like, and always have a plan B. It's amazing to me how many people come in to me um, from a bad employment relationship and they never thought of in their whole life an alternative plan. I've never worked a job. I, I worked for myself and I got a plan B, okay? I have a plan B. You must. Okay, all right, I'm gonna cut it off there. If you have any questions for me, uh, I'll be around. Uh, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, my contact information is on the outline, um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you for the opportunity. Once again, Mr. Kenneth Walker with the Walker and Chamber Attorney at Home. Very good. Um, let's go ahead and bring your keynote speaker to the to the stage. Let me let me turn. I'm not going to read all this because I mean.
we, we know who he is already, right? We, 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 we've seen the great work, we've seen the history. Uh, page one, two, two pages in, you'll see the Conrail story, you see the, the history and the, uh, the About Us page. Uh, you go a few more pages in, you'll see um, Lifetime Achievement recipient. So right now, if you get ready, please put your hands together. Welcome to the stage, President of Conrail Construction and Real Estate, Mr. Gerald Alley. by this young man. First of all, thank you. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, good. good. Uh, my name is Gerald Allen, and I'm representing a company called Conmeal, and we're proud to say we're celebrating our fourth year in business. So the first question I want to ask myself, I ask you all, can I see this Who is this young man here? <laughs> Who is this young man? Son. Right. Thank you for honoring me to give a time to walk down memory lane. I'm going to follow that lead and, and take you down memory lane. I'd like to thank the chamber, I'd like to thank Linda and the rest of the members, as well as having a fair in the community to celebrate and also educate us in this business and the business in general. Uh, one of the things I'd like to start out with by saying is that um, that I, I've given a life, being given a lifetime award. Um, and when I think about that, I think about the Oscars. And I always think, here comes some old person that never won an Oscar. They drag them up and say, hey, you want the lifetime award. That means you're not getting an Oscar. So, I, but I do appreciate the, the recognition of the tenure we've spent. And one of the things that I admire most about this whole journey is not any minor successes we had on the way but our ability to understand challenges and understand failures. And I coined this three and a half hour speech by just saying, <laughs> you get it, you get it, just kidding. Uh, to say our failures are our true measures of success. We all been in life and we go through failures. And failures are temporary. That's the first thing I wanna say. And what we have to do is measure the success the failure as a moment of lesson. The moment of lesson is where you look at in the abyss and you have no answer. And you say, the only thing I got is will to continue after this failure. So what I'm gonna take you is down memory lane. I'm north of 60, so I'm gonna do it in decades. And from that, you can probably understand the journey we are constantly on. First of all, a little bit about my background. They said, I'm not they say, I am from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And I grew up in the pre-civil rights area. And in that area, we had a unique town in Pine Bluff. About 50,000 individuals, 45 miles north, south, east of Little Rock. But uniquely back there, we had a town that was majority African American. We had a town of entrepreneurs. We had a town that had a local college. We had a town with four high schools. That means you could fight people of your own color on any side of the town. And from that, we learned we were in a, a sort of unique space in a small town in Arkansas. And we saw a lot of people. And I lived literally a block off the campus. And from that block off the campus, I was raised by um, a mother and a father. My father was a, a businessman. He was a, had a service station business. He from, at that time, Arkansas EMN, which is historical black college. My mother was an educator, but she stayed at home to raise five of us. And we grew up very humbly beginnings. And the thing that kept ringing out, don't spend things on what you want because you want to need it. You want to need that money when you need it. My father's key to success, and I would always, what's the key to success? He said, get up early and stay in late. My mother's thing was, get the best education you can and help somebody along the way. So during that time, you know, growing up, you, you, you really don't follow what your parents say when you're young. And I was typical of that. I was the youngest of five, so I learned from my siblings what stretch you can do and get away with. But we did break every labor law because he worked us when we were kids, <laughs> free labor, and we wouldn't even have the, the nerve to ask, you want to give us any money for working? Because he just looked at you. 
So after graduating from high school, I lived across the street from the campus, so I said, well, I'm going to go over here to this campus and have a good time. And my mother had a different vision. She said, no, I need to send you to the University of Arkansas. Now, the environment of the University of Arkansas back in 1969 was, I go from, a, like I said, a small black town with none but us hardly in at least half of us in it, to an all-white city in the mountains with an all-white university. It was that dramatic shift that pushed the issue of challenge and change. And, but I still had my DNA that I liked socialization. So when I get to campus at age 16, I moved off campus and I created a party house. And I took more classes I should have, and I realized at the end of, getting to the end of the first semester, my grades were underwater. And I had to go home, and Christmas that time, the, the semester break, you, you go to your Christmas break, and then you come back and finish your exams. I get home, and the first thing I see my father, he said, don't mess up my money. And that's the clean version. <laughs> So I said, okay. So we have Christmas, and the day after Christmas, I tell my mom, I gotta go back to school. She said, well, I just gotta go back. I didn't have a place to stay because they threw me out of the house when I was staying. Mm -hmm. So I go back and I stay in the bottom of the dormitory two weeks, studying day and night. Two weeks, and my biggest fear was not flunking out, it's going back and see this man that I messed up his money. <laughs> So after a long journey of that two weeks, I came back and I missed probation, being on probation by two decimal points. For me, it was okay. I'm not on probation. My grades are still not good, but I'm not on probation. Fast forward to my first, so that was the, the lesson I took away from that was things look very dismal, but the will to continue to fight in those two weeks, I studied more in those two weeks than I did that whole semester. And that's what I think I learned from my mother and my father was, is never over until you quit. Now, we go to my first job here in Dallas. I was working at a store, anybody know the store named St. Harris? <laughs> it was part of the Federated Chain, which became Foley's and now Macy's. And I was there as, a, as an assistant to the assistant, to the assistant. So, but I went home and see I ran the store. <laughs> so when I realized my career wasn't going well, I said, I called my mother very desperate, saying, I don't think I'm gonna make it here. And she said, well, you know what your problem is? I said, what, they got to me wrong. She said, no, you need more education. I said, more education, I got a degree. She said, you need to get a master's degree. I said, mass degree, so I followed her lead. I interviewed several colleges around here, and I was pretty depressed because one college officer said, we can give you an undergrad degree. I said, I got an undergrad degree. And they said, and on the way home, taking the bus home, because I didn't have a car here. I live in Fort Fitzhugh, and they said, there's a college up there, it was called s and They said, that's rich, and these kids go. I said, I'll take a swing at the bat. Went in, talked to the people, they asked me about my background, they asked about my grades, and I said, can we talk about something else? <laughs> and I learned the word Calvin Trian. I told the guy, I said, if you look at my freshman year to my senior year, it was a positive trend. But because my freshman year was so bad, no matter what I did in my junior senior year, it just averaged out. So I turned the table and said, it's not about me, it's about you, SMU. You have not built people who can build wealth on the other side of the freeway. So you fail as a university. I said, I heard. I said, if you gave me an opportunity to do this, I get in business, and from there I can come back and represent, and you'll be a full-fledged university. <laughs> he sat there and he said, well, I don't know. I said, Am I wrong? He said, well, write a business plan. To learn from that, you write a business plan. In a business plan, at that time, you write your expectations. You don't write where you are. So I wrote the business plan, came back, and little did I know SMU was trying to get some semblance of diversity. And they pulled this sheet out and they said, 
Why don't we get this guy shot? He said, but you know, we're not gonna change any rules. It's a one-year program. Can't make less than one B one semester. All the classes are very tough, and I don't know who's gonna let you in. They said, one question, now we are pretty pricey. That's why I figured you guys got the money. <laughs> he said, okay, let's let's look at it. So I get the invite, come in as and you take the program. Had we through the program straight A's because I'm focused now. I'm working 40 hours a week, but it's not like not being respected at the store I was at. So I was pretty excited about that. And I learned one thing, the guy said, when you come here, we expect you to be leaders. I looked to my right, I looked to my left, and I said, these guys want to be leaders. And I don't have to do all the number crunching. That works for me. Get through SMU, first opportunity I had, and I've worked for three individuals in my life. My father, the gentleman at, at Sanger Harrison, this gentleman right over to my right, Calvin Stevens. He had just finished SMU. And we started a incubator program to help small businesses. And from that, they put me in charge of assisting contractors. And my background was finance, so I said, they said, first, the number one goal you gotta get is get these contractors to get a bond. And I said, okay, what's a bond? They said, it's, the, so I go to the insurance company and say, this guy needs a bond. Little did I know that was a whole challenge. And from that, I left a cabin and started a consulting firm to help small contractors. Year and a half into it, they cut funding. So one of the things of being younger than everybody else in my family, you learn from others. So I had a list of all the problems that small contractors had. And I listed them down. I said, if I don't do that, then the difference is I could probably make it take a shot at it. So instead of facing the problems that others had faced, I faced it, but I saw what worked and what didn't work. Well, now we started this in 1979. We now have changed from consulting to construction, so big failure, big loss. But I go and we start the business and we learn to change when the market changed. Now I go to 10 years later, 1989. So it's this man and this 10 thing is going to make sense at the end, or you get it on the way home. But in 1989, I was doing the largest projects in Waco. It was a VA hospital. And got upside down on the project. And 10 years in business, and I thought after seven years you got it down. But 10 years in business is your first gut check. We were losing so much money on that project. I had to go down and relieve the entire staff, but the youngest person on the staff. So we had a staff of the eight to run that job, management-wise, 40 in the operations field. We boiled down to him and I. We were fighting the VA, we were fighting every subcontractor there. And the bonding company was on our backs, and we said, it's no way out. Well, first of all, I hate to sound, but I got very religious at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you find where your capabilities are and what your limits are, you're going to have to go to God. I did that, and then God said, get up and go to work. So I went, and we fought through that. We fought through that, and we ended up working through the VA, but something happened. While we were fighting the VA, we had somebody we knew in California that Kaiser Permanente had pulled out of Texas, moved to California. They were looking for a firm to do medical. Now, we had a historical psychiatric hospital where nobody that looked like us had an experience. They hired us in California to run a project at no risk for $200 million. So we went from failure to change, and it's your theme, say expand, and we took that failure and used it as something of experience. So we were going pretty well. Now we're up at 1999. We had a, we're 20 years in business. I'm saying, well, you know, things got to settle down. Get the DART project. It was a DART project. It was a $20 million project. It was a large project, DART contracted with an African-American firm, building a bus maintenance facility. Got upside down with that project. So bad that we end up losing about 6% of our equity. And it's a hard lesson to lose what you saved up. But my father's point came back to me and said, remember, don't spend money that you want because you want to need it because one day you want to need that money to get you out of trouble. We were able to overcome that 
that project and we were able to transfer our business into another model of business which not only kept our existing model of business but we learned from don't always put your eggs in one basket the, he just talked about plan, plan B you always need to have a plan B so we ended up protecting our assets the remaining assets we had in the company finishing the project and I kept saying at that point what's more valuable saving the dollars I had or saving our brand. And I was talking to an attorney, had several attorneys at the time, and he was saying, well, you know, we can jettison one company off and we put asset protection here and you might have to get rid of Conreal and you can have a few dollars you have left because you put all your money in one basket. And I made a conscious decision to say, at that time I lost my parents, I said, he kept his station 47 years, it's Alex SO service station. I said, we're gonna keep the brand, we're gonna fight through it. Lesson number two was that, wow, things are rough. God got me out of that VA job, he needs to get me out of this. Got that done, got it resolved. We're going pretty good, okay? So we resolved that. So the lesson learned from the, the failure we had was you, offset some of your failures with other alternatives and other methods to overcome your lessons. Now in 2009, okay? 2009, 30 years in business. We, were, we, had, we had changed our business model from in Grand Prairie, we moved to Arlington because we failed. Arlington was the center of the universe and I got my counselor right in the center right here to prove it. And we said, we need, the problem is, we don't really have a base. Like most big companies, they have a connection with the city they're in. I lived in Arlington, but I really wasn't connected. I worked out of Arlington, I worked out of Grand Prairie and had offices in Dallas. But I said, it's more important, when you look at these companies, all companies go through abs and flow, successes and failures. And that's why you need a public entity to support you because you're going to support them because you're going to hire their employees, you want to have more invested into it. So we, after having the scenario, we left Grand Prairie, went to Arlington, got involved with the Community Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, started giving back. I said, well, maybe our problem is we're just doing business. We're not really involved in the community. But that was very much inspiring to us as we found that business and relationships and community all weave together for the outcome. In comes Jerry Jones with Cowboy State. We had worked that thing all the way from Arkansas to Arlington. We thought we were going to be part of that state. We knew we were going to be part of that state. We had the commitment from the owners, Stephen, Jerry, heard about we part of the state. Matter of fact, we took people from church to church to promote that state. And we got down to the point after the vote was healed, they said, well, you know, it really doesn't work for us. I walked out of city council at that time, and a pastor friend of mine called me and said, Gerald, I know you're down and out about this. He said, but you know, sometimes God may have a plan. If you work for something as hard as you can, do the best you can with it, and you don't get it, maybe one year deal. That didn't feel good at the time, but I remembered again what my mother said, always look for another alternative, always expand. So I said, you know, really, what is going to change by Arlington, by the Cowboy State? I said, I need to get involved. I joined the uh, Arlington Convention and Business Bureau. And then we did a study and found out the biggest impact is hospitality. So naturally, we tried to get people to move hotels for hospitality. Ran into a friend of mine and said, you know, you get people to, to try to build hotels, why don't you build it on a hotel? And thought about that. Well, in that year, we ended up buying property on both sides of I-30 because we had failed to get the Cowboy Stadium. And every piece of property we had was prime property because nobody really responded that fast. Then we went to hotel owners, Marriott and Hilton, and said, I'd like to build a hotel. Had a hotel experience, I said, check in and check out. <laughs> they said, okay. So I said, look at the property. They looked at the property and said, well, we could, we could get somebody to own it. I said, no, we want to own it. They said, okay, if we manage 
I said, we'll think about that. They end up giving us the franchise and the and approval of the Hilton and the Marriott and Hyatt's, and we had three properties, all prime properties. When we sold it to, we said, go with the best you got, and we built the first hotel in Arlington in 21 years, a Hilton Guardian, after this one. And it became the highest revenue park hotel. And my message is, the failure was not getting a Cowboy Stadium. That was the opportunity that would have given me time to focus on something else. And focus on something else is where a lot of times we slip. We slip and we, we, we garner in failure. But failure is an opportunity for success and expansion. So I'm going to go back a little bit. And in 1995, which is an odd year from the Nans been going with, we tried to do the Ranger Stadium. And the politics weren't right. We wanted to do the suites and things of that nature. And they let us build the prototype. Came out very well. They said, no, we. We, we got one contract that we don't believe in sharing this with. Well, I have to say, 25 years later, we're building all the insides for the Ranger Stadium today. And that says to me, longevity <laughs> is an opportunity that you have to look at in a long game. And when we, we also built the Lowe's, uh, live by Lowe's, we built Texas Live, over in Arlington, we're doing over a quarter billion dollars worth in our hometown. And that is not a short story, that's a long story. Anthony and Anthony Sampson was with, with us when we tried to do the other stuff. He's in the back, his insurance company, uh, agency, great insurance guy. That's a close for you, Anthony. Uh, stand up, let me see. And, and one of the fights that we have is the tenacity and the willingness to lose and regroup. And one of the things I can tell some of you out there is that no matter who you are, no matter what credentials you come to the table with, you're gonna have you're gonna have setbacks, you're gonna have failures. But that's when you learn, that's when you grow. Everybody in this room has had a failure, and it's just a perception of how you deal with the failure. I want to wrap up with with my points to take away second year. And the takeaways is failure is just a point of time. There's a greater lesson in failure than it is success. Success is not a measure of how well you do but the impact you have with others. This faith, success can only be measured by how you improve your community. And what we, I see in the office all the time, do good as you do good. The last thing I want my hero in, in, in any kind of thing has been Muhammad Ali. And he had a quote, I went to his museum a few years ago and just reflected on him. And his biggest quotes just take me to heart. He said, if your dreams don't scare you, you need to get bigger dreams. He who is not courageous enough to take a risk will accomplish nothing in life. Service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. Impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. Impossible is potential, impossible is in temper. Impossible is nothing. A man who views the world at the same age as he's 50 or 60, as he does when he's 20, has just wasted 30 years. With that, I really appreciate you coming out. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Please stand up for Mr. Bill. Few new additions that anybody want to grab seats, please come forward. And one more time for Mr. Allen, Conrail Control. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
uh, on behalf of the Greater Southwest Black Chamber of Commerce, I'd like to present these awards to some very deserving people who made a big difference in our community. I feel like I need to do it again. I accept on behalf of E.J. Uh, e. Smith Construction, Ms. Sarah Fisher, Chief of Staff for E.J. Smith Construction Company. As you can see, Emmett and Eugene are not here, and they want to extend their sincere apologies for not being able to accept the awards in person. But I'm here, and what I want to do today is just give you a backstage pass, a short glimpse into what it's like working with these two gentlemen. On a day-to-day -day basis, I work with Eugene, um, and I see, get to see him. I wanted to share with you some of the characteristics that I've noticed during the times I've worked with him. Number one, Eugene is an expert at reading and interpreting contracts. And as we know from Mr. Walker, that's one of the most important things in being in business. He's a really good listener, and he tries to instill that to me every day because I am much of a chatterbox. Another thing about Eugene is that he's an expert at reading people, and he really knows how to make people feel very special. He's a mentor and a devoted son. And if I could lump all of these characteristics into a few words, they would have to be others first, genius maker. Eugene has spent his life mentoring others and making sure that whether you're a woman, whether you're a man, whatever walk of life you are, he wants to make sure that he um, shares his personal experiences with you. So now let's talk about Emmett uh, and what, I, what little I know about football. I mean, I know he's an all uh, Hall of Famer, I know he's a running back, and I also know he played for the Dallas Cowboys. And the running back part, I looked that up on Wikipedia last night. <laughs> so I get the opportunity of spending a meeting, or, or the opportunity of, of being with Emmett and Eugene and our CFO, Elsa Brown, every month at our members' meeting. So my opportunity involves taking notes, making sure that there's enough water and snacks in those meetings. And if you want to know, Emmett's favorite snack is baked Cheetos. <laughs> so I was a little nervous that first meeting, you know, getting to meet him and, you know, like, okay, well, after a couple of words, I'm going to run out of what to say because, you know, again, I don't know a lot about football. And so I was taken aback when I met him. He came up to me and he shook my hand and he told me about some of my accomplishments and how proud he was to have me on the team. He went on and on about how few women there are in engineering and construction. And then he turned to Eugene and Elsa and started talking about building grocery stores in underserved communities. Others first, genius maker. Today's theme is, hold on, your power is your mind. Your power is your mind. What if we were to take that theme, what if everyone in here was to make a personal decision and to take our power and to turn that into uh, building relationships or cultivating other people's minds? That would be a testament. That would be a legacy. Well, today, again, I would like to thank you on behalf of Genius Maker, Eugene Walker, Genius Maker, Emmett Smith, and E.J. Smith Construction Company. Thank you. Let's say good morning to everyone, and I'd like to really appreciate, show my appreciation for the Greater Southwest uh, Light Chamber of Commerce and Linda Gray. When I first met Linda, I, I didn't know anything about uh, the chamber, but she made me know about it, and she, uh, she's been one of my, my heroes. I, I appreciate this award, and because all my life, I've only had uh, two jobs. One was from SMU, and one was from General Abbey. So he hired me, and I hired him. So we've been at it a long time together. We've been knowing each other for
20 years. And let me see one other thing about Gerald. That's, you paid $20 or $35 for this breakfast this morning or lunch this afternoon. <coughs> Some of you didn't pay anything, but you got $1,000 worth of information from uh, Mr. Allen. I hope you get a chance to talk to him again because he's, uh, he's one of the good guys. And, 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 and being a good guy, I said, Gerald is my friend. I've been knowing him a long time. He's in construction business. And I had some problems on, on my house when we had some construction. He said, don't ask me. I've never built nothing in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just hire people to do it. <laughs> he said, you better go get a handyman. <laughs> but anyway, I do a share with him. He doesn't know how to do no tools. <laughs> but anyway, I, uh, my career and my life has been my my allocation is minority business development, and my career has been minority business development. So I'm like Emmy Smith or any other football players. You know, my, what I do is my allocation and my profession are all in one. I have never done anything else. I've only I've been in business for myself 42 years, and every day I get up, I gotta help some more black people. I gotta help some more Hispanics. I gotta help some more women. And that's all I, my kids say, Dad, I don't know what you do. We came to find consulting. But all I know is that you are on top of trying to help somebody. And if you can't help somebody every day, you know, you can go get a check every two weeks, that's fine. But life is about giving back and helping somebody else. And, and instilling in your children to help somebody else so they can continue going. Gerald and I both came out of the pre-integration, pre-civil rights, and we thought it was over, but it ain't over. We got a lot of work to do. Thank you. First of all, I was only kidding about feeling like the old Oscars, but this is on, and I really appreciate it. And I like to take this minute. We talk about life achievements and. One of the achievements in life is my family. That's my daughter. She's here to public and community relationships. She keeps me in check. Uh, Dante, he's a cybersecurity expert. So uh, it's just good to see family around and what the impact in life has. And again, keep pushing, keep moving, keep changing, keep expanding. Thank you. Another round of applause, please, for all our students. <laughs> all right, now, then, then get back to the seat. But right now, we're going to have our special guest come to the stage. We're going to mix it up. We're going to let him do a little speaking on himself. So right now, put your hands together for Mr. Dixon Edwards. Yeah, well, I don't know how to follow all the people that are here today. And I, I do believe that everything happens for a reason. A lot of things that I'm, I'm doing now, and um, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up. But uh, it, it looks like I'm getting very close to it. Uh, uh, I always like to open up with if, because uh, I feel that I'm in entertainment for the event. Uh, any questions related to the Cowboys because I used to play for the Cowboys. Now I'm not Emmitt Smith quality Cowboy. <laughs> you know, I was on three simple teams with him though, but yeah, yeah. But if anybody got some football questions as it relates to this stuff, no, any, any, I, I, yeah. What kind of <laughs> well, you know, I, I was kind of hoping that they'll do a Herschel Walker trade with you. You know, well, why don't you get, matter of fact, I, I think, matter of fact, you, you think about it. <laughs> I think Coach Johnson would have traded Troy Aikman if he believed that it would have made the team or allowed the team to win three or four more Super Bowls. You know what I'm saying? So if, if you know, but, you know, people have different values. You know, the the value that people don't really pay attention to, I believe, is the uh, marketable value. He has a great marketable value. Uh, as far as athletic people on the team, 
He's always on the field. He is in the top five athletic persons on the team. I think he doesn't, uh, you know, my, my position is that I go after running backs, you know, so ask Emmett. I hit him once. <laughs> I hit him once in the game, he went out. <laughs> but anyway, so, but he's, yeah, he's one of the top athletic guys on the team, and I, I, I do believe that um, it would be very important for him to get out there, but he needs to watch this, though. Uh, the career is very short, uh, and the people that are behind him are young, and there's always uh, someone to replace someone in the sports entertainment industry, you know. So I'm, I'm hoping that he, he has great advice. To... <laughs> I've, I've always felt that uh, school is in, in a place for a reason, and, uh, and I've also created an organization to be able to help people that get to a point in their life where they start to get afraid. So I was never a sports fan. I never had any interest in sports at all. But I always saw that sports was an opportunity for me to do other things. So when I got out of sports, I said, well, why don't you go and benefit other people related to the sports and entertainment industry, like kids? So I went out and started an organization called SAM, Sports Arts and Media. Not everybody's gonna be a sports star and everybody's not gonna be a, a performing artist, but there are a lot of professions that are related to that, that industry that uh, people can benefit and get 24-7 uh, you know, careers about it. So I started this organization. As this organization came about, we started morphing it into the hospitality industry, which is very interesting that a lot of people in this room have something to do with the hospitality industry and construction. We're presently in the, in the, in the, uh, the process of building, you know, in a hotel and uh, maybe a sports aspect related to it. So it would be a very interesting conversation with some of these people here today. But I, uh, I think that if you can offer, you know, kids uh, an opportunity to see something different, it will eliminate a lot of the fears and in their lives, and uh, I think that is, you know, one of the things that I see sports has offered for me in being able to go forward. So I went out there and I and I got myself an insurance agency license. I have an insurance agency. I'm actually going to have to leave here pretty soon because I'm, I'm actually taking classes for a real estate license, and I, I do really believe that. A lot of the people that I've met here today uh, will help with me in uh, trying to figure out exactly what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. And I do appreciate the opportunity of the Chamber being able to invite me here today. And um, like I say, you know, everything happens for a reason. Me being placed in this room today with all these people here today, um, I promise you I will be able to take advantage of this thing. And thank you very much for inviting me. Just to do more justice to Mr. Edwards, uh, you can read his bio, you can read uh, uh, along if you want to. We'll read together and we'll do a call and response. Uh, retired Dallas Cowboy, three time Super Bowl player and entrepreneur, as a businessman, DJ, internet radio broadcaster, and former star linebacker for the Dallas Cowboys and the Minnesota Vikings. We forgive him for that. During the five seasons with the Cowboys, Elvin, <laughs> Edwards helped the team win three Super Bowls and played as a starter in Super Bowl. XS511 and so no way. Uh, Super Bowl 38 and 30, is that right? 38 and 30? Or is that 30? DJ Mixon Dixon. Oh, DJ Mixon Dixon is his name on, on what's on what's what's they on the station or you just just, just DJ Mixon the yeah, Yahoo good. Alright, um recognize our sponsor, especially our title, title sponsor, uh, the County of Dallas. This is the one representative to thank you guys, this title sponsor. Platinum sponsors, Dart and, and Toyota South. Thank you, Dart, and I don't know if Toyota South is there. And also, since I see Carmen, when is, when is the small, what's it called, small business university? When is, small business academy, I'm sorry. September 12th and 13th at Dart headquarters. September 12th and 13th at Dart headquarters. And how can they go on dart.org or dart.com? Talk to Carmen about it. getting in. I've participated and worked with Carmen a few times. A very powerful academy if you're looking to do work in the in the dark space and get subcontracting opportunities. You want to talk to Ms. Carmen Garcia. And also our gold sponsors, Train, Heaven 97, Silver Sponsor Citywide, Arkansas, Heaven 97. Okay.
switch my weather. Uh, yeah, sorry, okay, cool. And citywide, with a citywide, that just started from heading out I'm leaving one. Bronx sponsor, uh, City of DeSoto, J.E. Dunn, the Hadley Brothers, Options Real Estate, Triple J Construct Design and Construction, uh, Gold Federal Credit Union, and Vicky Mallet, Dice, oh, CPA. Did I miss anyone? I'm sorry. I make sure I got one. Very good. So right now, we're going to check the agenda. I believe we're going to go to lunch and please be cognizant. Oh, no, that's not right, Mr. Jones. Yes, I'm going to bring up Mr. Uh, W.D. Jones to uh, wrap this up. Oh, Mr. Jones, very good. I'm sorry, I didn't know you. Mr. W.D. Jones. Good morning. I'm W.D. Jones with uh, Triple J Design and Construction. And I think this has been like a wonderful time to come and to get to know everyone here. We have a little time left that we may be able to network and see what everyone does. Uh, I thank us uh, for the opportunity uh, today to meet different people. I met Gerald Allen many years ago, and he's gone, but uh, I can remember he took me and out and beat me up went to my job sites and beat me up and showed me everything that was wrong. Then he took me to his office and helped me out with my business, gave me software, took my secretary in there. And to this day, that has helped me in my business. And I use that today, the things he told me then, in my business today. So uh, I thank him and I thank those who are here that we may get together and help one another to do better in our business and the ones that are really doing very well, can help those that are trying to do well. So I'm here today and I'm thankful for all those and as we close today uh, on this hat, on this occasion, that we, on the next occasion, that we will be able to network and know each other better. Thank you. All right, very good. So at this point, we'll get ready to break for lunch and following that, we head to our breakout sessions. Is that true? Very good. So thank you guys. Thank you.